So, hello people at Easter Hack and in Hamburg at the Kampnagel. Hello people in the internet. Uh, welcome to this presentation called Buntes Back Bounty Part 2, Update from the Dialogue on Cybersecurity, uh, a project we started with the Innovation Council Public Health rather recently. Um, well, uh, let's start. Um, this talk is meant in the spirit of Cunningham's Law, uh, the best way to get the right answer on the internet is not to ask a question, it's to post the wrong answer. Uh, in this spirit, I would kindly ask you to get involved, scan this QR code and access the PED. If I did not mess this up, uh, the link should also be in the pretext in the program. Um, because we're trying to learn things and make people talk to each other, which usually don't talk to each other. And um, yeah, let's see where this goes. So please bear with me and imagine you live in a perfect world because you will need this in the upcoming minutes with puppies and rainbows and a certain interpretation of unicorns. What does this, what does this perfect world include? It includes security researchers not being prosecuted when they're doing their work. Everybody got an S-bomb and their socks ready to go at a moment's notice. You know, people well rested, caught enough sleep, no vacation ahead, no holidays. Then we look at the life cycle of a vulnerability. You know, one of those nasty things hidden somewhere in some kind of code. The first thing that can happen, which is the best part of a life cycle of a vulnerability, uh, the software it was in gets decommissioned and it's never get used or discovered. It's a sad, lonely life, but also rather uneventful, which we kind of might like. Uh, the other way to go at this is someone discovers this vulnerability. And this could either be a white hat hacker or a black hat. And then two things could happen. Either people are like, yeah, you found this vulnerability, so what? You can now change the color of the things I write on my personal blog where I describe rising rose bushes in the backyard in Aachen. Or something like a race starts because things might get ugly quick. So the question is, what happens if this race starts? Um, you can have very smart people like Desiree, who actually you write about that, how you look after which vulnerabilities you run after. And if you have one of those vulnerabilities reported by the white hat hacker, they can report them to an organization, or they can report them to some kind of Git repository where they found it in. And then, this can take up to six years to get the information there if you look at lock for shell uh, The lock for shell vulnerability, Gendai injection, was reported 2016 on Black Hat. lock for shell was found 2022, and, well, that's six years in between, so perhaps if people would have talked to another a bit more, some of us could have had more of a Christmas holiday. Um, because everybody got an S-bomb, this organization would probably have an S-bomb to look up where this vulnerability goes to and could then report to the Git. And because this Git also has an S-bomb, it could report to the Git that's actually the underlying core issue. Like with the Innovation Council of Public Health, we found out that we have a core piece of open source technology we call Iris Connect, and it actually shares gRPC protobuf with Sixtor, which is not something that you might expect on the first notice looking at both software frameworks. And then there are other frameworks and dependency graph, and you can look at all those. And if you look at this vulnerability, there's one, there are two questions. The one question is, how do people actually report this? The other question is, how do people tell each other if it's somewhere in their dependency graph? Those two questions are, as we found out within this project, questions that might need some thinking about, and eventually people having innovations and things. So this is the Cunningham's law part for the second part, because now there comes a thing where I try to think for myself. Uh, if anyone still wants to flip out the smartphone, be my guest now. Um, so what did we learn so far? If you compare those two questions, the security researchers reporting and the green question mark and the Git repositories talking to each other in the amber question mark, they're standards. 
There is the RFC 9116, which is a file format to aid in security vulnerability disclosures. It's called security TXTs. So we actually know how to put up a standard uh, for systems in production, how to get contacted by security researchers. And we have a standard for that. So people could kind of enforce that, and there could be laws written about this, and you could also say people were not up to standard if something goes wrong. But there's a standard. Th those tend to be useful if done well. There is nothing we're aware of in the field of uh, open source projects. Somewhere, somehow, in some Git, you might find some information whom to call, whom to contact, whom to write an email to. Because maybe, just maybe, you don't want to put the vulnerability you just found in form of an issue uh, in the repository for everyone to see. Then there are procedures. There are procedures for uh, reporting vulnerabilities. The Dutch have one. They're kind of nice. Uh, if you report on vulnerability, you can publish, they will not punish you, and you get a t-shirt. That's kind of cool. Uh, then there's the third bund, which uh, published a new um, guideline for coordinated vulnerability disclosures on the 1st of December this year. Uh, people took it for a spin, and it took months to actually close uh, public uh, health information leaking to the public due to a um, appointment uh, appointment scheduling system that was having an open API somewhere on the internet. So you could see who would go and where and see which doctor. So maybe there is work to do. Um, also about the procedures, there are procedures in place to contact open source frameworks like EU FOSA. EUFASA is a rather successful European Union project that allowed for 309 reported bugs, 130 vol uh, valid vulnerabilities, and of critical high severity bugs to be discovered. Who in this room used PuTTY? Ever. Okay. Who of you didn't use PuTTY in the last 20 years? Okay. All of the rest of you, you actually used a highly vulnerable program that allowed for remote code execution on the service you accessed. So um, sometimes it's the tiny pieces that make the problem. And it seems to be rather widespread. Yeah, what next do we have? We have legal frameworks, and now it gets funny. So when we come to legal frameworks, when it comes to reporting vulnerabilities, there is a legal situation on the German federal level. It's called the hacker paragraph. Um, the CCC has a rather valid position on this. Can we please put it away? Um, but it's still there. Discussions are to be had. And unfortunately, um, the Constitutional Court didn't help this time. So we might try to get more creative. And then there is a discussion at the European level. THS was there last, well, November, and talked about how it would be helpful if the European Union might try to help to basically drain the market on um, trading on security vulnerabilities, because trading on securities might get wrong if, well, it's not Bitcoin and stuff, right? Um, then there's the OECD, which has a surprising progressive view on that. They take more of a economic view on the damages done, and they badly encourage vulnerability treatment. Then there is a Europe, uh, then there is a United Nations, as Khaleesi mentioned yesterday, and also was so kind to, pound, uh, to point out last month at uh, the Netzpolitische Abend. Um, yeah, there is the UN Cybercrime Treaty in the making, and it seems to be a hacker paragraph on steroids. So if anyone feels like doing international politics, well, please help the woman. And things might look a bit better because actually the yes seems to have understood on some level that this might be a bad thing and uh, there is now an executive order on the prohibition on use by the United States government of commercial spyware. Somehow people might eventually somewhere learn something from Pegasus. But this is going to be an evolving space in the next course of the year and we're trying to maybe put a dent in the discussion. Yeah. Um, then there are legal frameworks when it comes to making Git repositories talk to each other. 
The European Union is working on something that they call the EU Cyber Resilience Act, which is a rather <clears throat> interesting thing to put things forward. Um, they basically imply that if you use open source software, uh, when you have a commercial use for your software, that means that either someone gives you money or you harvest their data by using your programs to then sell those data to someone else for money, um, you're liable if there's something wrong with the open source software. So eventually this at least establishes some kind of liability between people running active systems using open source software and the open source software itself, which, this is explicitly relevant, they don't hold the people making the code liable, they hold the people liable who are using it. So there, there is a like first step forward. Then there is the question, are there, are there institutions who do preventative work, like to prevent vulnerabilities to happen? There is the OpenSSF, funded by um, companies from the US, funded with 150 million euros, uh, for two years trying to run back resilience programs and uh, building on the whole discussion. And in Germany, we have the Sovereign Tech Fund, who actually has not only 10 million to foster the health of open source software, but also in addition to the best of my understanding, a 1.5 million funded uh, back resilience program in a starting phase. So Europe might be a bit late to the party, but apparently there is public funding in it, which the people in the US don't have. But things are slightly moving forward. And if you look at this, the last question that remains is, do we have actually institutions who do reactive work? And there's few and far between. There's the OpenSSF who discuss building a FOS SOC, where they want to build a SOC for open source software. There are the Apache and the Linux Foundation actually have reporting processes for software stacks that they maintain and take care about and deem relevant. Um, well, that was tried to be used in the lock for shell incident. Those, well, I see processes leave things to be desired. Yeah, so that's what we learned so far in the first half of the year of this one-year dialogue. Um, and we're trying to look at all this and not get, well, insane. And we thought that we will propose solutions that will allow people to talk to each other. And um, that's the current state of the discussion that will be coming next. So if you look at the solution to how can we get this stuff done, if you start with a security researcher, they would like to have a single reporting entity. Because an example, if you look at the CVD process of the BSI, we're in the situation that um, the BSI did not talk to the data protection agencies because uh, the data protection agencies are actually capable to put a fine on a company. So to open the CVD process and to have companies voluntarily uh, have a discussion with the BSI about some security vulnerabilities, they tend to not report the companies to other agencies which might enforce fines on them to actually make them play along. It's a discussion to have had if we wanted to go this way. Uh, this reporting entity could also give out a crypto token to the people who made the submission. Um, if so, people tend to have the discussion if there should be some kind of a custodian involved. Uh, this puts up lawyers who actually by law are holding certain privileges when it comes to the communication of their clients and they could act as intermediaries. I'm interested to see where this goes. And then this reporting entity also has to report, put the report somewhere, right? So for example, to the BSI, which then can give it to the uh, institution that's actually in charge of taking care of the issue. This is an overview of Germany's cybersecurity architecture, which is kept regularly updated by the uh, Stiftung Neue Verantwortung. Um, as you can see, this might get a bit confusing if you're a security researcher and you're trying to figure out whom the fuck to call, actually. Yeah, and then there are the data protection officers, who are also the people you might want to talk to, because if you, well, look at an API and it smiles at you funny, and you say, well, let's crawl this thing, and then you sit there and you have two million data sets at your hands with health data in them, you might have to actually write two reports at the moment, which is, well, perhaps more hassle than needed. 
And then there's the big open question, like, who's actually going to call the open source people? Because at the moment, it's like a goodwill gesture, but because they're not companies and they are not obliged to any legal framework in Germany, there's not much that is currently there in a structured process. Well, because also on the other question, who's going to pick up the phone, right? So what's the idea to fix the other issue? The idea is to make kids talk to each other. Put it in the pipe. Because, well, there's this question, whom do I call in Europe? It's also, whom do I call in open source? And there are processes with the Apache Foundation where you can put up those calls. And now the idea is we call it Giturity, hoping that someone is coming along who's better at naming things than we are, uh, as a mashup of Gits and security. And we suggest a solution that speed is not perfection, which would help more because at this point, uh, still 20% of the Log4j frameworks used to this day and repos being addressed uh, still have a Log4Shell vulnerability, but apparently nothing's burning at the moment. So what is the idea of security? You take the concept of a security TXT, you try to build a standard which might only take six to seven years because then perhaps people might see why this might be relevant. Uh, you combine this with Git repositories. You take the idea of the corner vulnerable or RSS feeds uh, to actually automate the process to make them talk to each other. Uh, there is a lot of work being done um, for automation. There are robot TXTs which already show that this can be done, where your websites talk to Google crawlers. And then the question, what are the things we miss, like an X factor, to get to a successful concept? And is that OSPOs and foundations adapting open source frameworks? What do you think would help for open source projects to either talk to each other or make them reachable for security researchers? Yeah, that, that would be great if you could talk to us. Uh, we're kind of going on tour with this. Um, you can meet us at several things, like the Hack and Apparel, the NPA, the FOSS Backstage, the Ether Hack. Next month, uh, Bianca Kastel and Sabine Grieb are going to be at the BSI IT Sicherheitskongress. People submitted papers to the troopers. There's going to be a camp this August. And if you have suggestions where we should go, please let us know. We might try to put in a CF uh, CFP. And also, we put up an online series, and I missed to translate this site. So every third Tuesday in the month, there is an online meeting. Uh, Last month, we had the Log4J team and um, the OpenSSF represented by Christian and Brian there to talk about how they saw Log4Shell and what consequences they draw from it. Um, on the 18th of April, we will have the BSI cert, and now this is the today's announcement, uh, which caused me being late. Um, we will have the data protection um, officer of Berlin take part in this discussion and talk about how they handle their processes to actually make uh, reports on vulnerabilities or data breaches. Um, in May, Katie Musiri from Bluetooth Security will hopefully explain to us what, to new, what not to do when setting up bug bounties, because they, as the title of this project, Montes Bug Bounty suggests, were our first glimpse at saying like we could build an intermediary solution, like if I put out a bug bounty and tell you to hack me, then perhaps the German government might be less inclined to come after you with a hacker paragraph. Uh, then the, um, in June, there will be uh, a talk about the, well, general legal situation of security researchers in Germany. My Dr. Vogelgesang, we hope to uh, get her or someone else from the SEC for research team, which put out a remarkable paper um, then for uh, July, we're looking for community recommendations. Is there someone we should invite? Is there someone who might have a contribution to be made? And then we're looking to have a panel discussion in August uh, on a place and with people contributing uh, that still is in the works. Yeah, and that's basically it. Um, this might have been a lot. 
I hope I didn't steamroll you too much. It's been half a year of long discussions pressed in, I don't know, a couple of minutes. So um, please either write in the pad, and if someone can actually look at the pad and tell me what's written in there, because I can't open it right here, uh, or ask questions, I'd be happy to hear them and address points we missed. Okay. Those guys, yeah, uh, they tend to have a lot of fun with URLs and as of late cookies, if you read their publication from yesterday. Um, they're a group of independent hackers from Berlin and they basically um, look at the systems they discover in their everyday life and they publish when they find vulnerabilities and they report them. They gave a rather amazing talk um, in 2021's well, Remote Congress together with Linus about uh, security vulnerabilities and what it means for them and how they get treated. Uh, they make regular encourages with companies telling them that there is this hacker paragraph and that they will sue them for hacking their system when they try to tell them that their APA is actually openly accessible. Did anyone see any typos? Oh, we get those a lot. Did I butcher any pronunciation? When do you think will the hex paragraph disappear? I honestly don't have an idea. So, um, what I feel like is that the idea of abolishing the hacker paragraph has been spoken for several times by several institutions. Uh, we also have the um, coalition contract of the Ampel Coalition, which actually said that they will try to allow for, um, how to put this, legally secure, uh, well, a legal framework that allows to do security research without criminalizing yourself. To this point, there seem to be discussions ongoing between the um, Ministry of the Interior and the BSI whether or not how this could be implemented. Um, but as Khaleesi pointed out in her talk yesterday, um, in this space there seem to be the same problems if there are in the discussions around chat controller. Um, I think they haven't yet gotten used to the fact that actually in democracies elections might have consequences and that the course on certain areas of, uh, of your politics might actually change after an election. So um, this might be a long discussion to be had. But eventually there's like a fix to it. Like if the state would go ahead and say like, here's a bug bounty and we will pay this to you if you report vulnerabilities in certain critical systems and we can actually go ahead and we can ask our suppliers to put out bug bounties on their software or otherwise we're not gonna buy their software and try to see if the buying power of the German state still means a bit but I have honestly no idea. Sorry. Yep. Does this answer your question? So the question was, when will the hacker paragraph disappear? Now we have two people over there. I'm not sure whom of the two of you, okay, the person in the front asked first. So that would be uh, you. Um, Pardon me, could, could you try to get a microphone or speak up a bit? I have slight troubles understanding you. You mentioned uh, the Netherlands. Are there any other good practice uh, countries you could mention? Um, there are quite a few. We're trying to work up a comparative review of the implication of, I think it's EU regulation 2013 something. I 
can put it in the slides if I upload the presentation, that um, show for good practices. And I think that there is a, a huge discussion to be had to, to learn from each other. Um, what I find remarkable is that the Netherlands actually also have a hacker camp like us with the Shah. And there the government actually reaches out to the community and gives out prices for the best reportings being made. So um, I, I feel like there's a lot to learn. Um, yeah. I'm not entirely sure if I understood your question correctly. You're asking if I'm aware that the German government... Yes, that's true. It's, um, it... I, I, I completely agree. Um, a worldwide solution might be nice. Gaturity TXT as a standard Hopefully, in an IEEE format, might be a step towards that. Um, I, I do kind of have a similar stance on this, like on climate change or the climate catastrophe. Um, I would kind of like to start at home, and we're in the situation that the U.S. do have reporting processes, which, due to my personal understanding, not meet, meet the, uh, the requirements I would like to see, because. Uh, a U.S. intelligence agency actually have the right to use vulnerabilities that are disclosed to them for their own uh, for their own use. Um, I feel like it might be a good idea to actually. Um, I talked about this at Hacking in Parallel for for a longer point to have a anonymous or pseudonymous uh, low threshold, not making you a criminal, ethical way to report vulnerabilities, and eventually Germany could step in there and say that if you report your vulnerabilities to us, we will set up a process that will ensure that those vulnerabilities are not used by intelligence agencies. And um, if that's done correct, this actually could be used internationally. I'm, I'm, pardon me, I seem to have something with my ears today. Could you? I, I'm, I'm fully aware of the fact that intelligence agencies, so the question, the comment was that I will not be able to take intelligence que uh, agencies out of the picture, which I completely agree with. Uh, I'm quite certain that they're closer to me at this moment than my laptop. Um, which is a lie because my phone is over there, I'm sorry. They're as close to me as my laptop. Sorry for that. Um, but I, I feel like if we make up a process that might include some kind of a custodian function that will actually also know about the reported vulnerabilities. Like if I give this to my lawyer and then my lawyer gives this to people, then my lawyer can publish that I reported something. And then at least we can have the transparency that might be necessary in a democracy to actually talk about things. Because at this moment we're in the situation that there's this hacker paragraph out there no one ever has been, um, has gone to jail for it. Tons of people have been threatened with it. Um, this includes pro highly profiled security researchers like, you know, have you ever been? Well, Lilith talks about being threatened with the hacker paragraph, which is like the wrong person to do that to. Um, but, how could, I mean, what else can we do? Does that make sense? Okay. Are there more comments and points? Does anyone else feel inclined to talk about intelligence agencies and uh, my way to butcher the English language? Does anyone have an idea to how to do that better? 
other than write code that doesn't have vulnerabilities in it. Now, th th this is a serious question that we have to ask ourselves. Um, how is it possible that for six years there is one of the most widely used um, lock software is out there called Lock4j, and they don't get to know about uh, a vulnerability that's known in the security community. So the intersection between people actually building stuff and those well, playing around with it and breaking it doesn't seem to be as good as it could be. And that's a question where we, I think, might start to talk to each other a bit more um, how this can actually be fixed. Because, of course, we can ask for the BSI to put in um, a state-run process to do all those things. But that might not solve all the problems eventually if they could be solved by a single email. Like, if the Lock4j team would have gotten an email in 2016 like, hey, I found this vulnerability and I think it applies to you, they could just have fixed it. Then there are two questions. I think she... That person asked before you? And you have the mic. So I would suggest you ask your question with the mic. Okay. And when you've asked your question, and this time I thought about repeating it and answering it correctly, you take the mic with you and bring it to the people in the audience. Is that, yeah. Does that work? Yeah. Great. So please okay. let me hear your question. So what I want to know is how... I think you mentioned something at the beginning that there is some kind of bit of material for software, so to know what software components are included. How many open source projects do have something like that? Well, the, yeah. not as many as you would like. Not as many as I would like. Unfortunately, also not as many as would make us sleep well at night. Um, that's why I put this in the assumption in the front that everybody got an ass bomb. Um, because basically no one has those. And we actually need them, and people are talking about this, and it's part of the Cyber Resilience Act of the European Commission that if you build um, software, they will have to include as bombs at least on the first level. So you will have to list all the packages you include. But setting up as bombs is still an open question. Um, but I basically skipped that part and put it in as an assumption to point out that if we have as bombs, there's still work to do and doesn't fix all our problems. Okay, yeah. Does that kind of answer your question? Yes, it answered my question. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if it's good to say it now, but, uh, and I'm not sure if uh, it's... I uh, once I read a paper about the process of uh, BSI and uh, BKR and other secret service uh, institutions and that they have a process for um uh this for vulnerable for uh, sicherheitslücken and all that stuff and that they have a process uh, to deal uh, which um vulnerabilities uh, the uh, BSI can uh, report and which one uh, they, um, the Secret Service and BKR can take for them. Is it, isn't it right? Well, um, so this, this has been said. Um, on Defense of Con 2020, I actually ask a BSI representative directly uh, on stage with a running mic and they said that they don't have such a process. Um, and but did you read that paper? I haven't read that paper. Okay. I would be happy to read it if you could send it to me. Yes. Um, the, the point at this is, as was pointed out earlier, if intelligence agencies are involved, we're in the situation that, at least to the understanding of some people who actually studied law and something useless like mathematics like I did, um, that, you're, um, that they wouldn't even be allowed to tell you if they had such a process. Yes. So as soon as it includes intelligence agencies, um, the participation of the agency itself is privileged information to be kept secret. Thus, people would, even if asked about it directly, have to lie to you. That being said, 
I know some people who work at BSI assert, um, who told me that if they would become aware of such a process, this would lead to their resignation, and that kind of seems believable. Mm, yes. But, it's made, but, but I think it's, how is this uh, institution called, who made this uh, graphic about these cyber institutions? The reporting entity. No, I am... Um, the BFDI. Uh, no, uh, on, the, on the right, my English is really bad. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, Don't be. <laughs> that one. Yes, Stiftung Neue Verantwortung. It's, it was yeah. maybe if it's from um, this uh, bubble, this uh, paper. It, but but I'm oh, well, really sure I read it, but um, I'm not sure if I understood it. Okay. Maybe there is, there, there is a slight confusion there. To what I have understood from talking to the people from Stiftung Neue Verantwortung, we're in a situation that there are processes how that would react if their vulnerabilities reported. Like how the BSI would actually talk to the BKI, the basically FBI equivalent of Germany, to go after the people using the vulnerability. I think there are two questions to be asked. The one question is, we have a cybersecurity incident, someone gets hacked, someone gets ransomware. Um, who will look at the vulnerability, who will help the people, who will help to get the computer systems up and running, and who will all be the other people who go out there, kick down doors, and arrest people for doing that. And as far as I know, there are processes in place to take care of this, where basically the BSI takes care of the cyber part and the BKA takes care of the kicking in doors part. Um, I'm hoping I'm getting this right, if someone in the audience knows more about this than I do, and I'm quite certain there are, and I messed this up, please let us know. Looking at you. Second row. Okay, concentrated on something else. Um, does that help? Yes. Okay. I have a question. Sure. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, Hello. The BSI uh, does also other, other things, uh, for example, um, publishing uh, the so-called Grundschutzkompendium. Yeah. And in 2023, there's a, a section which requires, at least for those who need to be compliant, uh, which are public institutions yes. mostly, uh, to have a vulnerability scanner. So this partly, at least, uh, Sparks the hope that uh, some that people will, will get uh, vulnerabilities and kind of an idea, which is uh, what is running on on their premises. So it's a little bit like S bomb, but not really. Well, it's basically looking at it from the outside, right? Say it again, please. It's it's like looking at the running program from the outside. There, it's no. No, the basically with a vulnerability scanner you, you can do authenticated scans, and this okay, and this basically is supposed to do a software inventory. Great. So that is basically S bombs through the back door, but not really. Mm -hmm. uh, for everybody who's I don't know really how good the project is, but uh, there's an OVAS project which is called Cyclone D uh, DX, which is supposed to provide uh, S bomb information. Okay. It's open source. Thanks. Okay. So if anyone wants to use Cyclone to scan for vulnerabilities, please do it on your own hardware, and thanks for, uh, thanks for the contribution. Good. Does anyone have a watch to look at and can tell me how we're doing with time? Still time left, or are we more or less done? Does anyone want to discuss things? Because there will be a workshop after where we can perhaps more productively discuss this without a camera and people from the internet watching us and me standing in front of you and not seeing half of you because there are light in my eyes. And, um, hmm? Okay, so it's 15 minutes, so there's another five minutes. You will have me standing here and beg you to ask questions so don't feel embarrassed. Or not? Well then, oh, there, there's, thank you for.
Ja. I'm quite certain they're doing that. There are laws in the books who enforce them to. And at least the uh, head of this, um, I think it's division in English, uh, of the cyber, who is in charge of cybersecurity of the um, Ministry of the Interior is also under the impression that he can buy zero-day exploits on an open market if the price is right with an exclusive right to use it. So um, I'm quite certain there are not only those who are enforced by law, but those who are just actually taking regular business with federal governments at this point. Because in Germany, we do have a Staatstrojaner where um, federal agencies are supported to hack back and spy on people. So I'm um, quite certain that's the case. Okay. Am I correct in not seeing any hand? If so, please wave more vigorously so I can see the movement. Okay, if that's not the case, uh, thanks for all your time. <laughs>